Take a look at your service information system's maintenance schedule for any of the vehicles that you've serviced over the last few days, and I'd be willing to bet that the coolant change interval is listed at 100,000 miles or even longer for that vehicle. Extended life, 100,000 mile coolant, lifetime coolant, they go by a variety of names. Are they really able to last as long as they say they are? That's the topic of this edition of The Trainer. Stick around. Now your service information system and the OEM maintenance schedule may tell me that the coolant vehicle in this truck, for example, doesn't need to be changed but every 100,000 miles, but that's not entirely true. There are other outside factors that could come into play that could cause the inhibitor package included in the coolant to be depleted prematurely, and when that happens, it opens this, up the system to potential damage and wear and tear uh, because there's no protection that would normally be provided by those inhibitors. Now, real quick word, what's an inhibitor package? Well, coolants are basically the same. There's three different types of technologies that are generally in play. What makes them different is the inhibitor package that's included. And the inhibitors are other chemical additives that are used to help protect the interior passageways from damage, from corrosion, from rust, uh, to help lubricate the water pump in some instances, and a few other factors that come into play. It's part of the OEM design process and it's one reason why you see the OEM specifying a particular type of coolant for their vehicle. And yes, you may be familiar that there's red, yellow, blue, green, every color of the rainbow when it comes to coolants, but that is not the deciding factor on which coolant to pick. What we're going to focus on today, though, is a lesson that we learned from our Class 8 tractor buddies, and that's how to test the coolant, to check the condition of the inhibitors, to check the health of the coolant so we know whether or not it's able to continue to do its job. And the first thing we want to check is what's the mixture ratio? Is it really 50-50, or is there something going on here that I don't know about yet? The first step in checking the condition of your customer's coolant is to ensure that it is at the proper 50-50 mixture. Now, we don't know what the customer's been adding to it. We don't know what the kid down at the quick lube has been adding to it. Heck, we don't know what the last shop that worked on it was adding to it. They could have added water, they could have added coolant to a low recovery bottle. Who knows? That's the first thing we want to do. And we're going to use a tool called a refractometer to find out what that is. That's the best way to make sure that you're reading it properly and you're getting an accurate assessment of the, of the mixture. Now, before we can do that, again, this is a, a lab quality tool. We need to make sure this is zero. We need to make sure this is properly calibrated. And we do that using some distilled water. And we're just going to place it uh, on the prism. Close that little slide cover hold it up to a light source and make sure that the blue line is right at the base, right at the zero point. If not, there's a small screw here at the top and we'll actually make the adjustments there to bring it down in zero. Once that's done, we can go ahead and check the coolant itself. Okay, now before you just go and grab that cap, make sure that it's not hot, maybe warm, not hot to the touch, feel that hose, Give it a good squeeze, see if there's any pressure in the system. The last thing we want is to pop a cap on a hot system and burn ourselves. Okay, once we know it's safe to open up the system, I'm gonna pull the cap out, take a small sample of the coolant, and then we'll put the cap back on. We'll take that sample and we'll put it on the prism just like we did the water. Close it up. And like just what we did with the distilled water, we'll hold that up to the light and see what kind of mixture we have. Easy enough. Using the refractometer, we've confirmed that the coolant fill on this vehicle is still in the 50-50 range. The coolant manufacturers will tell you, or most of them will tell you, that you don't have to be dead on the money 50-50. 40 to 60% is acceptable. Now, if it's outside of that, that needs to be corrected. And providing there's nothing else wrong with the coolant and the other tests that we're going to take, you can do that by simply adding either straight coolant of the correct type or distilled water to the system.
to get it back into that 40 to 60 percent range. Okay, now that we've verified that the mixture is in the proper range, the next step is to check the acidity of the coolant. That's going to give us an indication of the health of the inhibitor package in the coolant charge. And to do that, a couple of different ways. The first and the easiest is to use a test strip like the ones made here by AccuStrip. There are other companies that make them, and of course you're free to choose whichever ones you want. Now to do this very simple test, all we need to do is access the coolant. I'm gonna go right here at the radiator fill. We'll take one of the strips out of the bottle here. Now this one uses three strips, three pads, uh, testing pads on it. It can test a few other things as well, including the mixture ratio that we talked about earlier. I prefer the refractometer because it is about as accurate as you can get. Um, here I'm going to go ahead and insert the coolant strip into the coolant, get it all the way down in the coolant for two seconds, one one thousand, two one thousand, and we'll pull it off and shake off the excess, then we're going to let it sit for 40 seconds and compare it to the uh, color charts on the side of the bottle. Okay, our 40 seconds is up and uh, I'm going to go ahead and put this up against the pH, the acidity level on the bottle. Uh, the tab that we use for testing this particular strip is the one closest to my fingertips, the one closest to the top of the strip, and we're right dead in the middle. So in this particular vehicle, this pH balance is exactly where it needs to be. It's not too acidic uh, and it's not too alkaline, so it's right where it needs to be. This coolant is uh, okay to continue in service. Okay, there's another way that you can check the acidity of the coolant, and that's by using your multimeter, looking for voltage there. And it's an old technique, one that's been around for quite a while. All you need to do is take the negative lead on your multimeter and put it on the uh, negative battery post, and then take your positive meter lead and insert it into the coolant, Be care being careful not to touch anything else. Don't touch the filler neck or the core itself. You just want to put this just into the liquid and take your reading. In this case, I'm reading just a tad over two tenths of a volt. Now you may be asking yourself, how am I measuring voltage in the coolant? Well, we measure voltage in the coolant the same way you can measure voltage in an individual cell in the battery. When the coolant becomes too acidic, it acts like an electrolyte, and it reacts with the metals in the cooling system and its components to create a voltage potential, the same way that the similar metals and the electrolyte in a battery cell work. Now, rule of thumb is I don't want to see any more than half a volt on my multimeter. If I see more than that, that's a good indication that the inhibitor package is shot, the coolant is definitely too acidic to remain in service, and it needs to be replaced. How? Full flush, and then replaced with a fresh coolant fill. Now, that's not the only way that you can measure voltage in the coolant. If there are bad electrical system grounds, uh, there could be current trying to find its way home to the battery using the coolant as a path. That would also explain why we measure voltage in the coolant. If we don't correct that, though, it'll make short work of any inhibitor package that we put in in the new coolant fill. So it's very possible that if we don't find and fix that problem, we can do a complete coolant flush on this truck today, and six months down the road, it'll need to be done again. Now, how do we do that? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go inside the truck. I'm going to turn everything on, key on, engine off, and measure the voltage again and see what happens. All right, so just like before, I'm going to put the positive probe tip in there, just in the fluid. Take a look and see here. We're measuring again right around 0.2 volts. Not a big change. So at this point, I'm really not too concerned about the quality of the engine grounds or electrical system grounds on this truck. Since I didn't see a marked change, I really don't need to proceed any further with that portion of my test. I'm pretty confident that the voltage reading is coming because of the electrolyte qualities of the coolant, the acidic quality of the coolant at this point. It's not exceeding the maximum, and as we saw in the test strip, it also passed the pH balance with that. Right now, I'm going to say the coolant charge in this vehicle is good to go for a while longer yet. Now, if I had seen a change in the voltage going up, uh, the next step would be to start the engine and get everything I can turned on and measured again. If that's the case, and I see that I have a bad ground issue, I'm gonna to have to use voltage drop testing procedures to check all the grounds, find out which one's causing the problem and correct that before I address the, uh, the coolant fill. As like I said earlier, if I don't cause or fix the cause of why that inhibitor package failed prematurely, all the money my customer just spent to have me redo the coolant fill 
is going to go to waste. Uh, another way that you can uh, isolate whether it's a ground issue or it's just the acidic quality of the coolant, take the battery completely out of the picture, disconnect it, both posts, and then use an engine ground or body ground or even the negative battery cable as a ground point for your meter. And again, repeat the test. If the voltage stays the same, again, it's the acidic quality of the coolant. If it completely goes away, go back to suspect again a battery or a electrical system ground issue. Talk to the coolant manufacturers and they'll tell you that another leading cause are combustion gas leaks. Getting into the co uh, coolant through the cooling system, through the cylinder head gaskets, uh, very small leaks, probably not causing a drivability or not likely causing a drivability concern, but there nonetheless. To test for that, a lot of different ways that you can. One way I'd like to share with you uh, is using this bullseye leak detector made by Automotive Test Solutions. Uh, it's actually a CO2 detector, and what's one of the byproducts of exhaust? CO2. So this makes a very good tool. It's a sniffer, just like you would use in an air conditioning system, but it detects the presence of CO2. And we're just going to put it right over top of the radiator reservoir, and if there's any CO2 present, it'll go off. In our case, we're good, so if I did have a problem with this car, combustion gas leaks wouldn't have been one of them. And there are a few other causes that can cause that inhibitor package to fail prematurely you also want to be aware of. We'll talk about a couple of them here. First is a history of overheating. High temperature extremes could cause that inhibitor package to break down and, and, and fail prematurely. So you want to ask your customer, have you had any cooling system repairs done recently? Have you had any issues with the cooling system uh, other than what we see here today in the shop? Another factor, air in the system. That's a big one, um, either because it's improperly filled or the coolant level is low and it's ingesting air through, uh, through itself uh, or it wasn't properly serviced to begin with. So make sure you check the service specifications and you properly bleed the system you know, when you're servicing it yourself. Uh, another word on servicing that we want to make sure we include, don't forget water is half the battle. It's half the equation when you're making up the coolant charge. Tap water may or may not be appropriate for your shop. You want to make sure that the water you're using is compatible with the cooling system that you're servicing. You're going to find in most cases it's not. Very common in most areas is adding water, aerating the water to uh, uh, help the taste of the water. So if you put that aerated water in the system, well, remember we just talked about air in the system, you don't want to do that. Well, there's your reason right there. Use distilled water, or better yet, just go ahead and buy the premix stuff. That way you know the water's okay, it's a 50-50 mix, there's no question about that part of your service. What about flushing the system? Well, that's a whole nother topic and a whole nother demonstration, but let me just say this. The water that you use to flush the system is just as important as the water that you put into the system in the first place. Just because you're not going to use the tap water from your shop because of the mineral content as part of that 50-50 mix, you don't want to use it as a flushing agent either. Sorry to tell you that, guys. If you're not sure about the quality of your water, check with your public utilities company. They'll be glad to help you. And you can get test strips from the same people that make the coolant test strips so that you can test the water yourself. If there's any question, yeah, I know. Will it make something fail tomorrow? Probably not. Will it cause a problem with the longevity of the components? They're not going to last as long as they designed to? Yes, and for that reason, and as professionals, we want to do the job right. You're not sure about the quality of the water? Use distilled water to flush your, your uh, customer's vehicle, and that way you will be doing no harm. Well, that's all the time I got for this edition of The Trainer. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I did in making it. See you next month.